Uh, hi, thanks for coming and <laughs> I'm talking to myself. That's great, Joe. Nice intro. Um, thanks for coming. If you don't, I'm Joe Albert. I teach in org leadership and in a minute I'll introduce Caitlin. This will be a fun event. It's the first time we've done this. Uh, last year we did a uh, roundtable, interdisciplinary faculty roundtable dialogue, and the idea behind that was to really explore how narrative and authenticity intersect. And the kind of roots of that were a class I teach called Leadership and Storytelling. And um, it was really interesting over time to watch students and myself included as part of the, the community that emerged uh, really begin to learn about each other and, and uh, learn about themselves in the process too. So we had the roundtable dialogues last year and then really Dr. Josh Armstrong is here tonight, uh, director of the CLP program, leadership program here, uh, sort of pushed me into this idea of learning about the Moth Project, which was a, uh, is a uh, storytelling initiative. Uh, I may, did it begin in New York, Josh? Did it? it? Josh was just there a few weeks ago actually and went to a live Moth event. It was pretty cool. And uh, so in our minds, as we thought about this, and by we, I mean, Caitlin Vollew, who I'll introduce in just a second, we began to explore the idea of, geez, could we integrate the, the roundtable dialogue with a moth-like event? And so what we came up with is, is tonight's program, really, where we'll have a blend of, of great stories, storytellers, uh, along with an academic grounding, which is, I, I think, important at a, at a university to have that perspective. Uh, the panelist will, I uh, will introduce in just a few moments, but the format very basically will involve um, us kind of listening to the first four stories. And our storytellers were chosen through students and recommendations and a variety of other means and volunteers, by the brave volunteers. And uh, I'm going to let Caitlin introduce them in just a moment. Um, we'll have four stories and then we're going to let the panelists just react a little bit to the stories and hopefully just answer the question of how that's landing on them, the stories. So, and then we'll come back, we'll hear three more stories, so we'll have seven stories total. And then we're just gonna open up for dialogue. So, the event wouldn't be possible, especially the reception outside with the, uh, without the support of the Zag, Zag Shop. And I wanna introduce Gail Lancaster, who works with Scott Franz in the Zag Shop to talk about the sponsorship of the event. I've seen many of you, I work at Zag Shop West, I'm, I'm at the Kennedy store. Um, so we do have a lot of interaction with the School of Professional Studies, uh, comprehensive leadership programs, everybody that's, that's now down in the Fuller building. But we're glad to be a co-sponsor of this as we don't see ourselves only as the bookstore, but that's part of a bigger picture where we're, we have a part, we have a share in the sharing of ideas across the university. So we're glad to work with the School of Professional Studies to have the opportunity. This is our, our third. Um, we hope this becomes a regular event at least once each term and would invite you if you have an idea for upcoming uh, roundtables um, or events of this sort get a hold of Professor Alberts or Caitlin or myself and we can uh, work together, work one of these out for you as well. Um, the only other thing I have to say is would like to invite you, we do have a reception out in the, the foyer area afterwards. It's a chance to talk to the storytellers, to maybe get together and tell a few of your own stories uh, before you leave this evening. So again, welcome. All right. Is that okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Uh, panels, real quick. Kirk Besmer, Kirk's an associate prof in philosophy, teaches here at Gonzaga. Um, has been with us for the last uh, two roundtables, just been a wonderful contributor. Nicole Sheets teaches English creative writing, creative nonfiction writing at Whitworth University. And Claire Rudolph Murphy is a writer. Uh, I brought her into my class, just an amazing uh, uh, teacher and, and writer as well, but also a really good friend. And the three of them will be kind of reacting to the stories. Briefly, before I turn this over to Caitlin, something about the stories. Um, Narrative and authenticity is the theme. So every story you hear tonight is going to reflect in some way and touch on, uh, in some fashion, the identity of the person telling the story, what to listen for. 
I'd invite you to think about, as you listen to the stories, what is it that's revealed about the person in the sharing of the story? Why that story? In, in class, I'll talk about having a bookshelf of stories from your life. You know, why choose that story off the shelf to share about who you are? So that's an interesting way to think about how some of the stories will come out. We invited a theme tonight, of, and the Moth Project always has themes, and what we wanted to do was talk about stories and hear stories that you wouldn't normally hear at Gonzaga. Um, stories that maybe people wouldn't normally get to tell. Uh, stories that aren't part of our sort of grand narrative of, of what it means to be part of the Gonzaga community. And stories about people that we think we know, but until you know their story. So here in that, in their stories tonight, some of those threads and themes, and we're going to give you a chance to react and talk about this quite a bit. So we'll have four stories, panels, reaction, and then we're going to have three more and then open it up for everyone to share. So with that. Caitlin Vada is uh, just about to graduate from our master's program in organizational leadership. She graduated from Gonzaga a few years ago, uh, 2008. Uh, one of the only students I know of that ever did the honors, the comprehensive leadership, and the Hogan Entrepreneurial Program uh, as part of her program here is amazing. So she's got a Rotary International Rotary Scholarship next year to study abroad. So um, she's just been a wonderful collaborator and partner with this. And I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce the storytellers. Thanks, Joe. Um, we have some really amazing stories for tonight. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the first one. Uh, Dr. Eric Kincannon graduated from the University of St. Louis in Missouri. Uh, he's been teaching in the physics department since 87, uh, but he's also the uh, renaissance man of the physics department, according to his colleagues, because he also teaches the philosophy of time every spring. Um, he, uh, he's been married for 23 years. He's the father of triplets. <laughs> I know it was a credit. Joseph Matthew Rachel. Oh, congratulations. Like, oh, my God, Jesus. I don't want to. That's like horrible. I mean, in a really good way, but. <laughs> um, uh, he likes to spend his free time jumping out of perfectly fine planes. Um, and uh, he, uh, I, I wanted to say that he has the largest uh, All Star Converse collection this side of the Mississippi, but he says he only has 36 pairs. So, yeah, I was like, oh, that's, that's nothing. So, um, without further ado, um, Dr. Eric Kincannon. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Oh. Okay, actually, you have to do it this way. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'll use the mic. I got notes and a watch. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm father of triplets. I had a whole bunch of triplet stories, but I decided to go with the story of my grandfather instead. My grandfather... His earliest memories are being of an orphanage in Philadelphia. He doesn't know how old he is because him and his sister were just dropped off there. At about the age of 10, he couldn't stand the abuse from the sisters anymore, so he ran away and lived on the streets. He joined a gang, and he would travel through Philadelphia, robbing, breaking into warehouses to stay in, etc. When he was about 15, he was at a street corner waiting for his gang to come by to decide what they were going to do that night. They had a plan at a warehouse they were going to break into and get some stuff. It was at the corner, it was a printer's shop. The printer comes out, walks up to him and says, I know you, I know what you do. I have a cot in the back of my shop. You come in, you can stay, I'll feed you, I'll train you to be a printer. My grandfather says he cussed at him and told him to, you know, the printer goes inside, the guys never came up, came by. My grandfather thinks, I'll just go in here, I'll get a cot, I'll get some food, in a couple days I'll leave. He went in and didn't leave. He apprenticed with that printer and eventually became the head printer for the Baltimore Sun. This was at a time when newspapers were very important. My grandfather had a very important job at the newspaper. After everything was ready to go to press, it was his job to make sure that that morning edition was out on time. He was a real stoic. He wouldn't have known what that word meant because he had no real education, but he was a stoic. One of the amazing things that happened to him was when retirement came, he went, the union was supposed to have all this money ready for him, and it was gone. Every penny had been stolen by unscrupulous investors and people in the union that were no longer there. Grandpa had nothing for a lifetime of work. 
That's really upset my mom. And I remember being there in the drive to Grandpa's, how upset she was. And Grandpa had only knew in a couple, known a couple days. And his reaction was, what am I going to do? I got Social Security. I talked to the guy down the street at the market. He'll let me stock shelves part time. That's what I'll do. He wasn't a saint. Like all good blue collar <laughs> men in Baltimore, he drank. And after his retirement, Grandma would put on the kitchen counter a, gla a large glass of whiskey. And that's what he was allowed for the day. And, he, and she mentioned to me several times, your grandfather has real control. You'll notice he'll only drink that much. And you'll see it go down as the day goes on. One day, I'm coming into the kitchen. The glass of whiskey is there. And Grandpa's in front of it. And he looks down at me and says, where's Grandma? And I said, she's out back in the garden takes the glass, drinks it all, puts it down, takes down the bottle, and partially <laughs> fills it. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, there is no reason for Grandma to know about this. <laughs> so as that glass went down, I realized those five different spots were five different fillings as the day went on. I never saw him lose his temper. And he became upset at things, but never really lost his temper. It never became over-emotional. And one day when I was about 13, we were visiting, and he got a phone call. And it had been that the printer died. And this bear of a man who raised himself up as an orphan, who went through all those times with a family of six, just disintegrated. He fell down and was screaming out my grandma's name, Ruthie, Ruthie, he's dead. And he just collapsed there where he was. And it was terrifying see him do that. But it was the printer. It wasn't. He lost all his money. You know, I'll find something out. But the loss of the printer was too much. And we never asked about the printer. So I think about that story. And when I was asked to do this, I had thought, I had of course, thought about that story before. And Years ago, I used to think, you know, what do I, I, I know what my relationship to my mom is. I understand my relationship to my grandfather. But I used to think, what do I owe that printer? I think about, you know, being pseudo-intellectual. Well, there's that improbable chain, we almost, we, I mean, the things that grand, happened to grandpa, the improbable chain of events that led him to meeting grandma. Mine, I lead a probable life. His is an improbable. And I can think about the unlikelihood of even my existence. But I don't think that's it. I, I, I think about that, and I, I, don't, I don't know I'm using this word right, but I think it's a mitzvah. It's a great good, this printer did. It's, a, it's a, an, an extraordinary bit of Christian charity. And what do I owe him? Nothing. <laughs> what I do is I just somehow become mature enough that I can accept that gift, right? That he did this unbelievable thing by taking in this criminal into his house and giving him a chance. So that's, that's my grandpa's story. Thanks, Eric. Uh, our next storyteller is Rudy Mondragon. Um, he's the Intercultural Relations Specialist at GU's Unity Multicultural Education Center. Uh, Rudy's fairly new at Gonzaga, but he's already one of the uh, coolest dudes on campus. It's actually really hard to have a conversation with him because everyone's always coming up saying, Hey, Rudy, how's it going? You're like, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, Rudy's originally from L.A. And remind me where you went to school, graduated? Uh, UC Irvine. U UC Irvine. So um, here's Rudy. I feel all cool with my scarf. <laughs> is this going to go through the speakers or just for the, the camera? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So it kind of sounds weird. What's up, y'all? <laughs> uh, so my story it goes back in time to when I was a first year student at the University of California, Irvine. And before I talk about that experience, I'll kind of um, share with y'all this story that. I've only, t this is only my third time telling this story, and I think it's because it's one of those that hit hardest when I, when I went through it. Um, 
as, an, as a high school senior, I was uh, a student at Southgate High School, a school that was overpopulated. It was a predominantly Mexican-American immigrant community, and um, there was like a ratio of like 50 students per teacher there. And so not a lot of attention went to students there. A lot of the attention went on the, on the high-achieving students and on the at-risk students, what they call. And so I fell in the middle of that bell curve. And so a lot of the times the attention wasn't on me. The only time I actually got attention was when I was playing soccer, which I excelled highly in. And so that was the reason why I actually made it from high school to my undergrad, because I earned an athletic scholarship to play for the men's team at UC Irvine. And so had it not been for that, my grades, um, my academics weren't going to take me anywhere but to a community college at the time. And so I got to UC Irvine with these insecurities, um, not really confident about my academic ability, more so about my athletic ability. And so I always fronted. Fronting meaning that you put up this like pretend attitude or pretend um, kind of facade for people. And so I always fronted that. I was like high achieving. So people would be like, oh, what's your SAT score? And I'd be like, oh, I got a 1600, perfect score. <laughs> when I really got like a 700. <laughs> but I had this, that was my, my coping mechanism with my insecurities. I would, I would front, I would lie to people. Because then I had this fear that people would say like, well, you don't belong here. Which at times they, they would tell me when they found out that I was an athlete and that I came from where I came from. And so knowing all that, I, I enrolled in a remedial writing class, an English writing class, because I hadn't passed the requirements to make it into the the first writing class that every incoming first year student at UC Irvine was supposed to take. So I took a remedial class, and I was cool with that in mind. I was like, it's gonna be easy, hopefully I could get a C in the class and pass and just keep playing soccer. And so the writing instructor, instructor she told me, well, your writing is all right, it's okay, but I want you to go see the writing instructor and go get a, a couple of pointers um, and, and get that writing instructor to help you out. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, and so I met with, um, with the writing, the academic writing center and I arranged a meeting to have with, and I can't remember his name, but I remember what he looked like. And this writing instructor, elderly man, probably in his 60s, 70s, white beard, bald, white male. And uh, I've always, at that time, I was, I was very scared of white people. And so when I met with this guy, I was very intimidated because I held him up as a, as a writing authority, as like he's the one that's gonna tell me how to write. And so I was pretty excited when I first met with him. And so he looked at my paper, and bam, that red pen came out. And that's one of our biggest fears when they correct our papers when they bring out that red pen because you, you know they're gonna mark it up, right? <laughs> and so that red pen came out and he started telling me, yo, Rudy, well he didn't say yo, but he's like, listen, Rudy. <laughs> he said, listen, Rudy, you don't have a thesis statement, your body paragraphs are too long, your conclusion is weak, I want you to go back and rewrite the whole thing. Which he didn't know that I actually spent a couple of hours um, putting together and I put my heart and soul into that piece of writing. And looking back now, I realized that I wasn't writing for myself at that moment. I was writing for other people. I was writing for that writing instructor. I was writing for my teacher in that class. And so I went back and I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start rewriting this. And so I spent my whole weekend rewriting that paper on top of practices, on top of talking to my family and, and trying to have a social life. So I rewrote it. And the following week I met with the writing instructor again and he reread it and he told me the exact same thing. Your thesis is not there your body paragraphs are too long, and your conclusion is weak. Am I saying something that you're not understanding? Do I need to tell you in Spanish? And that's when I made the decision to never, ever go back to get help. My pride levels went up, and I said, I'm never going to get help. I'm going to do this all on my own. I don't need anybody to help me out. And so I went the remainder of my undergraduate experience kind of alone and not asking for help. And I had put downs, I had people in the rest halls tell me, you shouldn't have a scholarship, you shouldn't come to the school just because you have athletic ability. I had a higher G GPA than you, SAT score, I should have the scholarship, not you. And so those were things that would always kind of put me down and always kind of made me resist the help that the school actually offered and helped for students just like me, being a first generation student, the first in my family to actually go to college. But I was resistant to all that until I met my mentor, my senior year in undergrad. And that person empowered me. I remember the first thing that she told me when I wrote a paper, she told me, you're not writing for yourself. You're writing for me. I don't want you to write for me. I want you to write for you. And so that experience has just informed the work that I do now. 
I could have easily gone and done something different, but I do the work that I do here at Gonzaga because I like to point out contradictions. I like to point out injustices, and I like to point out when things like that happen to students so that I could be an advocate for them. And so this story, the reason I tell it now, because I finally have come to embrace it. And I can control the situation now and say, this is what happened to me, and I don't want it to happen to other students that I work with. So that's my story about why I'm here today. So thank you very much. You guys are going long enough. I'm not getting to use my gong. <laughs> okay, sorry. Rita, it's all up to you. Um, Rita Helmbrecht is a senior sociology major with political science and criminal justice minors. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Rita, Rita is very involved on campus. Uh, she's in various sports. Um, <laughs> she's uh, the secretary of the Native Club. She's a mentor for campus kids. Still was. Uh, I was. Okay, was for three years. Um, and currently, she works at a nonprofit that develops affordable housing. Um, and she recently found out that she uh, was selected for Teach for America. She's going to be teaching in Las Vegas Valley for the next two years. So, congrats, Rita. <laughs> you I really don't like talking in microphones, but I'll do it for the sake of everyone else. Um, so like Caitlin said, I'm really involved in a ton of activities on campus, and a lot of it is so that I can give back to the community, and it direct, directly re relates back to <coughs> the life I lived when I was growing up, and the story is kind of hard for me to share, so please bear with me. Um, nine years ago, uh, back when I was in seventh grade, I was at a volleyball game, and we had just won our seventh grade championship game, and I was super excited, and I was heading home, and I always got a ride home for one of my friends on the team, and as we were driving up, I noticed that there was just a ton of cars at my house that weren't there. My mom was home from work, which was really uncommon because she worked three jobs to support our entire family, so as I was, as I was walking up, I was extremely uneasy and didn't really know what to expect. You know, I'm in seventh grade, like, obviously I have all these crazy thoughts going through my head. And um, as I walked up, I looked through the window, and we have a huge window by our front door. And I saw my grandma, who's from California, and I knew that instant that something was wrong. So, I went in and I opened the door. And my mom immediately ran up to me and hugged me like I had never been hugged before. And the first thing I said was, is it Grandpa? And she just shook her head, and I knew it wasn't him. <laughs> and then I said, is it Old Dog? Which was our dog, our family dog, that we had for a long time. <laughs> just hoping. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, uh, I didn't even say it, but I knew. I knew it was my dad. And I just screamed, and I fell to the ground. And I didn't want to ask questions. I didn't want to know, because in my mind, it didn't happen. So I ran to my sister's room. You know, I had all the family there. They were trying to calm me down, but I didn't, I didn't want to know. If I didn't know, it didn't happen. So I had a conversation with my sister, and she was like, it was a car, it was a car. So I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, I don't want to know. And so in my head, I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's just in the hospital. Like, that's what it is. You know, I'm just going to convince myself that. And then my mom's like, you got to go to Grandpa Herb's house. That's where all your dad's family's at right now. Like, you've got to go with your sister. And still at this point, I really don't know what happened. So I got to my grandpa's house, and everyone's extremely distraught. I come from a Native American family, and I have a ton of alcoholics in my family, people that I, my mom typically didn't like me being around because of the alcoholism. And so we got there, and <coughs> I had found out that my dad, who was a recovering alcoholic, had killed himself. And everyone was talking about the letter, everyone was fighting about what was going to happen. I had a, an aunt tell me that she wasn't going to go to the funeral because it was so selfish of him. And I mean, I couldn't be around it, so I had left. And I don't think it really hit me until I was actually standing in front of his casket and could see him there and know that he wasn't alive. Like, I had convinced myself that he was going to jump out of the casket. He, there's no way I could describe him. He was going to be there. And I think that moment is when... I really realized the childhood that I grew up in wasn't really common. And I spent a lot of time growing up thinking that it was, that I, I convinced myself that it was normal. And 
I grew up in low income housing. Um, my brother was a drug addict. My dad was an alcoholic. The relationship that I built with my dad was through a glass window while he was in jail. Uh, I witnessed several of my family members being arrested. Um, I mean, th the list could go on. Uh, and I think right then is when I, I knew that something was wrong, but I reacted in all of the wrong ways. I, I decided that I just didn't care anymore. Why, why should I care? My entire life fell apart. The one person that I felt the closest with was gone. So I just lashed out in every way possible. I went to, I mean, by the time I made it to high school, because this happened at the end of seventh grade, so my freshman year I made it to high school and I made some real good friends and they were the least motivated people I knew and I got sucked in because for once I felt like I belonged somewhere and that someone cared about me and I started, I'd have my mom drop me off at school, be like, bye mom, and I would run back out the other door and do God knows what. <laughs> And I just got, you know, I just let everything go. And I was, I tested well above average when I was growing up. And I, I was relatively smart, but I just kind of went to class when I had to. I passed all my classes. <coughs> and finally, uh, you know, the end of my freshman year, I had this teacher come up to me and she was just like, what is your problem? Like, you are just the craziest person in school and you just cause so much trouble, but I see potential in you. And I was like, oh, get out of here. Like, I don't want to <laughs> deal with you. Like, I'm doing my thing. <laughs> And so finally, I put my stubbornness aside and I, you know, decided that instead of making excuses and feeling sorry for myself and saying, you know, screw everyone else, I, w I wanted to change my life and I really wanted to make a difference. And so I did everything I could because my freshman year I made like a 2.7 GPA, which I probably shouldn't even have got. I think teachers felt sorry for me. <laughs> and so I worked extremely hard and pulled almost a 4.0 my sophomore, junior, and senior year, and I made myself college bound when I didn't even know what college was growing up. I had never been introduced into it. I was, I'm a first generation college student, extended and immediate family. And so even when I was getting ready to go to college and I received, I'm a Bill Gates Millennium Scholar and so I have a full ride at Gonzaga. And, but even when that happened, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know what college was. I didn't know what the scene was. I didn't know how classes were gonna be. And so I was just like, okay, like, I guess I'm doing this. I've kind of just kind of went with the flow. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what everyone else is doing. But I didn't have anybody to, to watch after and really understand what I was going through. And so, um, you know, I got to Gonzaga and I jumped right in and I've been extremely involved since I've been here. And a lot of my motivation obviously comes from everything that I've been through. But I don't want you guys to think, oh, this girl has been through a lot. Like, that's really cool, everything she's overcome. Because that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because I want people to feel sorry for me. I'm not up here to tell you the sad story. Like, it's really because, like, I honestly want to make a difference and in, in see kids that were just like me and realize that their life's not at an end when something like this happens to them. And, you know, I, I can come up here and pretend, like, I'm a happy-go-lucky person with everything that's going on, but the reality is, my family issues didn't go anywhere. I still deal with it. My mom works three jobs and makes less than $30,000 a year, which is less than what it costs to go to Gonzaga. My brother, I just got a phone call two weeks ago that my brother's in jail. I got another phone call a week ago from my niece saying, I just heard sirens. I think daddy's back in jail. She's four years old. Um, I just got a phone call from my mom yesterday saying that she thinks that uh, my brother's girlfriend is on drugs and driving around with my nephew, so she has now took him in and is taking care of my niece and nephew, and my mom has already raised three kids. She shouldn't be forced into this. So with that being said, like, obviously like, I still go through these things. This is stuff I consistently, de consistently deal with, and it's not going to go anywhere. But instead of feeling sorry for myself, like, I just really want to make a difference and impact other students, which is why I'm doing Teach for America. Like, it's a great opportunity. You know, I've been offered a few other jobs that would obviously pay a lot more, but it's not what I want to do. I really want to give back and change the lives of someone else and hopefully give them the motivation that I was given. So yeah, that's my story. Okay, that was, oh, that's not the mic. <laughs> um, that was seven minutes, but I was like, I can't gong someone because that's really rude. So I, I don't think I'm going to get to use the gong at all. Um, anyways, uh, okay. So I, our, our next storyteller is uh, Bailey Kellogg. Bailey is born and raised in Spokane. Uh, she's a junior at Lewis and Clark High School, and she's a student in Mary Beth's class. Mary Beth. 
um, who is a wonderful teacher. Um, and she, poor Bailey has been having to put up with myself and several other Gonzaga students because we come over, uh, uh, Hannah, Ashley, Kristen, they're all here, um, come over and teach a storytelling class uh, with the help of Joe. And uh, hopefully she's not sick of us yet. <laughs> um, uh, as Mary Beth says, Bailey is really beginning to discover her voice as a writer and um, has a powerful short story for, for uh, to share with us tonight. And um, Bailey, I hope that your future story continues to involve writing in some way. So. Moral support. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my I've been on that weekend of this Shortly before her death there was a photo taken of my mom. She's at a basketball game. It's a game I played in, and in it, I took part in a three-point competition. I'd gotten a huge black eye a couple days before the competition when I'd taken an elbow in practice. And when I look at the photo taken that the two of, us, of the two of us at that game, I know a couple of things for certain. I know she loved to watch me play. I know that the two of us were on We're on that day joined by similar feelings of irritation and worry how we were, worry over how we looked, um, and, a reluctant, and a reluctance to be photographed. I wish I had not been so reluctant. My fear was looking foolish in front of a boy, and hers was looking ill and fatigued from a four year battle with lung cancer. I'm certain her reluctance was more legit. <laughs> it's now been two years, going on three years since her death. It's taken me two years to rebound from those four years of her illness. Within those years, I've experienced my fair share of hurt, growing up more quickly than I would have ever wanted to grow up. But I'm more grateful than I am hurt, grateful because my relationship with and the loss of my mom enabled me to understand the difference between ways to be good for myself in other ways in others in ways to be hurtful she helped me to be certain that my life would be better spent truly serving the needs of other people before my own and i've come to understand that there is no use in comparing the circumstances of another person's life to mine to try and to try to stand outside and conclude who has the right to be psychologically set back and who's just being a child there's not a person that I know that hasn't been dealt some situation that challenges their sanity and rocks their sense of who they are. But whatever it is that rocks us, my mom's life and de death helped me to know this one thing for certain. It's imperative to make something of your existence rather than allow yourself to die without having met the standards you wanted to. She lived just the way she wanted to right up until she died. It's sad that my mom was sick, and it's sad the result of her illness and death was the collapse of everything that could have collapsed. Every painful situation is sad when it comes to any person feeling a loss of hope. But there's no pain that time won't heal, that faith won't tend. Things only continue to stay painful when you don't take something from them. It was my decision to allow the death of my mom to erode the person I was becoming and cause and cause the healing to wholeness process to drag on. My choice to, be, to begin self-destructive and self-damaging disorders in order to hurt myself lengthen the time it would take for my enlightenment. I sought self-medicating and numbing through a whole series of behaviors that, thought, that I thought put me in control of pain and administered it in doses I could manage far better, better than the waves of grief that constantly battered me in the absence of my mom. If you ask me it's something of this nature, it's when something of this nature happens within your story that is the saddest part. When you allow previous missteps to push you into an even deeper hole and you get stuck there. When you bring your growth to a halt because you've been set back. The strongest people are among us. 
The strongest people are the people among us who allow nothing between themselves and their aspirations. No matter how severe or abundant the person's circumstances, strength is present in people who are dealt with the worst of circumstances only to, be, to a certain extent. The rest is measured by their ability to continue bettering themselves along the way. If nothing else, my mom emphasized the importance of my faith in life, in my life, and because of my faith, I am able to know now that all the good people who've come into my life are here for a reason. They make me believe and grow that, and feel sure that there's genuine goodness in the world. She'd always taught me to put, taught me the Christian ways and the lifestyle. I always liked it because everything my mom stood for and everything my faith taught me was to practice good morals and put others before myself. My mom, as I've called her, was really my grandmother. She rescued me and my siblings from a really dangerous life when I was just tiny. It wasn't until I grew up and truly felt the appreciation for her determination to put my needs before her own that I understood how beneficial putting others first is. Her death and the way it destabilized me the uncertainties that, the, that exist in my family regarding blood, genetics, and who I am to my biological parents has brought a certain need on, to part, on my part to reflect on things that I know are certain. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm proud of my faith and how it enables me to value the right things. I'm not caught up in what the media tells me I should aspire to. I want the humble life my mom led. I want to pursue the simple ways of Thoreau and the authentic ways of McCandless. Materialism just isn't my thing. I want to make things better. In that la last picture of my mom, you might look and see the shadows of, and bruises of the, that the chemotherapy and years of struggle left beneath her eyes. You might not be able to see the fight and the determination and the strength that brought her to the bleachers that day, but I do. I'm certain of it. Through my own blackened eyes, I saw them then, and through these eyes that were hers, then my mom's, and that right now are mine, I'm determined to see in myself today. First of all, thanks. <laughs> Storytellers. Um, let me open it up to the panelists a little bit. And um, reactions, what you heard, and we'll, we'll do this for a few minutes, and then we're going to hear another three storytellers, and then we'll just open it up for everyone. But um, Kirk, Nicole, Claire. If you could use the mics, too, that would be great. So what landed on you? What did you hear as, as you kind of? Is it on? Yeah. Um, I, I saw I saw patterns in all in all four stories of mentorship, of someone who represented a, a strength um, that was year, was there for all of you. And I think good stories are ones that develop characters, not only the main character, each of you telling that story, but developing other characters that were either in support of you or an, an antagonist. And all of you mentioned mentors that were. A strength and I think that we when we develop powerful characters in our stories it draws listeners and readers to it because we want some of that we want what those people had we want what they gave you um, another thing that um, I noticed was the evocative detail when you used words like front and I'm trying to look at my notes from Eric um, uh, the, the photo that um, Bailey used at the end, uh, the uh, details that Rita used when she came in the front door of the school and she went out the back. When they, we see those specific details rather than being told but shown, then the reader is part of the action and, and they get to participate. And I think it calls up our own stories. And the third thing I wanted to mention was each of you had some element in your story that called up something very deep in myself. And I'm, I'm very active in a writing group. I've been writing children's books for years, and I teach writing. And one of my writing friends the other day at a writing group said, she said, I think the reason I cried so hard at the chapter in the book where the girl's dog died was not that I love dogs so much, 
but that it called up some loneliness in my own life. And when several of you mentioned the death of someone, which I think all of you had, except Rudy, um, it reminded me of seeing someone I loved. My father came through the door when my brother was killed, and I saw him with crying, and I'd never seen my father cry. And so that evoked that for me, and I want to thank you because that is one of my powerful stories. And I think when we hear powerful stories from others, it brings up our own stories that made us who we are. So thank you. Um, I echo that. I think that stories beget stories, and that that's one of the um, great things about an evening like this. Um, I too want to commend the storytellers. I think it takes a lot of courage um, to to share uh, vulnerable pieces of ourselves. Um, I was reminded of this book that I read a couple of years ago um, by Lee Gilmore, and it's called Trauma and Testimony, The Limits of Autobiography. And her argument is that she, well, her project really is trying to figure out when, when a traumatic event happens, where does that end? And that oftentimes when an act of violence or something happens, um, that those repercussions you know, echo years and years and even into generations. And I, and I feel like these stories were, in a way, a flip side of that. It's like, where does charity end? And it seems like the good news is we don't know because it keeps going. And that those, those acts of um, kindness and, and of, of recognizing the potential in someone can, can keep moving forward. Um, I think there's a theme of identity, too, which... Um, is really important that that Eric's grandfather was no longer sort of this drifting kid, but became a printer, or that um, maybe going from uh, an athlete, but also being uh, Rudy becoming a student. Um, and Rudy, your story as one who teaches writing one, I found your story particularly terrifying because <laughs> to think about you know that part of our training is really is really um, to think about how to. Uh, how to respond to students in a way that is, a, is affirming. Um, so I, I, I appreciated your story, uh, given my line of work. Um, but I found these stories really uplifting, and to think about those, that those actions and the words that we have, to, that, the, that they keep moving forward. Um, I, I guess you know, one of the vices, uh, one of the virtues of philosophy is that it tends to um, move at the higher abstract conceptual level. This is also a, a vice, I think. Because storytelling is really, I think, about the particularity. And so, uh, like my other panelists, I started to see patterns emerge. Um, and what I, and, and I think that in some senses is, is a vice because it, it fails to overlook those, precisely those things that move us uh, emotionally. And I found all those stories very emotionally moving. Um, and, it, but what I, what I saw emerging were a couple of themes and that was uh, always a story, they're, they're all stories of loss, but also stories of arrival. They were a, a largely how I arrived here. And, uh, for the for the three three stories of, of people who are in the the GU community, I, I really noticed how it was. Here's how I arrived at GU and how I kind of fit in, and that comes to this idea of identity uh, that that was already touched on. But what I'm interested in is is how that identity um, uh, is articulated in a space of meaning where uh, the community is participating in that meaning. So so. It's interesting when you say, why did you tell those stories? They are stories of loss, but also stories of, of arrival. Here's how I wound up here, and then here's why I fit in with this community. And then those, those the stories of loss we can start to identify with as we've had those kinds of losses, or we can understand them. So, so I guess uh, the abstract level I saw were the, the, the themes of, of loss and arrival and fitting in with the community as, as emerging. Uh, but this, of course, overlooks all the, the incredibly moving details that I think um, really make the stories uh, evocative. Uh, but that's what I uh, was, was noticing, um, is especially the community aspect of the way uh, storytelling is really about dealing with other people in a way in which we find meaningful together. So, yeah. um, thank you for your insightful and wise comments. Okay. Um, our uh, next, we have three more storytellers. Uh, the next storyteller is Katie Herzog. Um, Katie is Katie is one of the kindest and most down to earth people ever. Um, she uh, she uh, she came to GU four years ago after working at WSU's River Point campus, and for the last four years has been Josh Armstrong's uh, right hand woman. Um, and uh, as the as the comprehensive leaderships programs uh, uh, program coordinator, and Katie recently earned her master's in educational leadership and administration, all the time working full time and being a full time mom, which is incredible. And uh, she just uh, recently was uh, hired as the new uh, 
Oh heck, the GU, uh, uh, the coordinator of the Leadership Resource Center, uh, which I'm really excited for her about. And she has two beautiful little girls. She loves spending time outdoors with her family. And um, she also uh, teaches, or no, she also uh, is the coach of a soccer team and and plays GU intramural soccer with, uh, with 19, 20 year olds and uh, totally kicks their butt. So here's Katie. really sore still from the last <laughs> game, so bear with me. Um, yeah, so the stories. Um, when I drive down the hill uh, from, the south, from the south hill, we crest over the hill, I'm always praying for green lights, especially right around Walnut and Fifth, because if I come to a red light, and I'm going to have to then have to avoid the eye contact with the homeless people who often, most often, are there looking for um, spare change. And um, it's always very uncomfortable for me. Until recently, um, thanks to my very bold and innocent children, who always are great about asking the really tough questions. They have no problem. Um, you know, what's the deal? Where's their own money? Why don't they have a job? And um, anyway, so that has led now recently to when we, we come to the red light, they scramble around the van and they grab granola bar out of this big box of Costco granola bars. And we hand it out the window. And one of them always says, oh, you know, Remember, Mom, you always told us things are going to just be a little bit better with something in your stomach. Life just doesn't seem so bad. We just got a little bit in the stomach. And, um, and then we roll up the window, and, and as we drive away, we always then construct stories for the homeless people. And we talk about, oh, I wonder if they were an architect who built a, you know, a huge skyscraper, or maybe, maybe they were a movie star. And we, we create these great stories for them and before we get to our destination. And then we always talk about... One of them always says, well, maybe they were an astronaut, like Grandpa was going to be. And tell the story, Mom. Retell the story. And, and so they're much better at telling the story of my dad, who's their grandpa. But um, I'll give it to you anyway. It started out when he was very young on the um, North Dakota Plains. He would pick rocks off of this huge field. And in trade for rides and airplanes, that landed on the field. So he would move the rocks, and they'd, the crop dusters and so forth would give him rides. And... By the time he was uh, 16, he had earned his pilot's license, just merely on this trade-out system. And uh, by the age of 17, he lied. And uh, to fulfill his absolute obsession with flying, he enrolled in the Naval Academy and was uh, accepted. And years later, graduated top of his class in Annapolis, um, the Naval Academy. And he became a, rose to the ranks and became a, an amazing, skilled, talented Navy jet fighter pilot. And um, handsome, tall, had the world by the tail. Um, he was in a special operations during the Korean War. His wingmen were um, Alan Shepard, who went on then to become an astronaut, and Paul Gil Gilchrist, who also entered the NASA program after uh, their naval days. And um, unfortunately, during the, the Korean War, he was on an aircraft carrier doing a special ops at nighttime and suffered a, a real traumatic, horrific, uh, what I guess I would call a psychological accident, um, uh, as a result of a really bad decision by a commanding officer, which led to a couple more bad decisions. So he was uh, paralyzed from the waist down as a result of this, and they sent him into the hospital, into California, and um, for the next month, he slowly regained the, the use of his legs and fully recovered. But in that time, he met my mom, who was a Navy nurse. And they fell in love, and within three months, they were engaged and married and, you know, started a family right away, and all was good. Um, unfortunately, the doctor's diagnosis, because of um, what he had gone through, uh, made him unfit. They said he's unfit to fly. And his commanding officer deemed it a fear of flying and stripped him of his wings, and he was honorably discharged from the Navy. And as my mom tells it, it was a turning point in his life. Um, everything kind of went down from there. And despite they started a family right away, they had four little boys in a time span of, I think, five years. And um, it, mom said, you know, things started to become erratic. His behavior started to change throughout those years. He was working. He was very talented. And he was a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, but he started to lose his job. He wouldn't be able to hold a job. He started to amass a lot of debt. Um, and he's, his night terrors turned into day terrors. 
and he soon became actually a real danger to the family. And right about then, mom learned that she was pregnant with her fifth child. That'd be me. Uh, the only girl. And uh, anyway, she was panicked. She was pregnant and panicked and trying to figure out what to do. So she called for an intervention. This guy cannot, is unfit for not only to be with his family, but to, to be in society. And so he was committed to a psychiatric ward. Um, unfortunately, in the 60s, um, in the later 60s, they, uh, the social services were cut, federal and state aid was cut, and hundreds of thousands of mentally ill people were turned out onto the streets. And that obviously is still occurring today. Um, and as a result, my dad was too. And with a lot of debt, lost the house, no money, five little babies under the age of eight, um, she was unable to care for him. But darn, did they ever mess with the wrong woman because she was bound and determined to hold to, to get some sort of compensation from the Navy because they refused to cover any of his uh, hospitalization or any of his care. So she went to war with the Navy and got testimonials from Ellen Shepard and all his wingmen and, um, and lawyers and doctors. And uh, after a long battle, finally won some compensation from the Navy. They took responsibility and finally she linked that accident on the aircraft carrier to his mental state. And what would have been and is probably the first or one of the first unrecorded um, cases of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, that now, obviously, I think we've all heard of that now, but back then there was no such thing and the Navy refused to acknowledge it. But they did get some help uh, for his care, but not for the family, nothing for the kids or, or her, but it didn't matter because she was, she was too amazing and not to be messed with. So she landed on her feet. We had a really, really scrappy upbringing, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, we scrimped and saved and did what we could. Um, she got my dad into a safe place he, off the streets, and um, he was safe for what ended up, unfortunately, being a very short life. But um, she did get him off the street. But when I get to that red light and I see the homeless people, we know they all have a story, and I... I see the story behind them, and uh, we have to acknowledge that they were astronauts or could have been astronauts. And I see my grandpa in every one of them, and I see the woman with the, the stroller on the street corner and uh, with the little kids looking for a place to stay. And at one time, I was the one in the stroller. And um, we just have to recognize that they all have great stories. and. Um, that I no longer pray to have a green light when I'm heading down the hill. Darn it, Katie. Jeez Louise. Um, Andre. Andre works for Sodexo and is, uh, is dearly loved by my students who, who eat at the COG, um, not only uh, for his incredibly positive attitude, but also for his incredibly catchy catchphrases like uh, cheddar is better and uh, mozzarella for the fella. <laughs> um, <coughs> Andre, Andre was born in uh, Concord, North Carolina. He gradu graduated from Fayetteville University and Johnson and Wales Culinary School. He's a proud father of five. And um, Andre, I'll give the mic to you. Now, most of y'all already know who I am, so I'm going to sit back here. <laughs> um, my story is one I find very intriguing to be here. I, I find it funny to be here uh, because I don't feel like I'm, I, I'm even worthy to be here, you know. Uh, but I was asking, and I'm going to share my story with you. My wife had to type this up. My glasses are gone, so I, she had to type it in big words, so don't laugh at me. <laughs> I don't read very well in front of people, so just bear with me. Here we go. To those who know me, I hope that my face continues to bring a smile to your face. For those who don't know me, may God's blessing continue to be in your life. My life began March 12th. 19 and a long time ago. <laughs> although, life has given, although life has given me tough times, I wouldn't change a thing. This sounds like something that most people would say. 
or we'll discuss that chapter later. Having lived in a small, having lived a small part of my life with an abusive father who was an alcoholic, there were many nights I would hear him beating my mother. Mm. We also came home drunk. Being five years old, my father would wake me up at 5.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning to cut his hair with, my, with his belt buckle, pretending that I was a barber, remembering the fact that I had to go to school in five hours. That wasn't fun for a five-year-old child, but those are things that I had to deal with. This is a little hard for me, so you got to forgive me for a minute. Um, But knowing you had to go to school at 5 o'clock and knowing that you couldn't refuse whatever his demands were because you knew what the consequence would be. To see my father come home from a street fight, cut from head to toe, receiving 125 stitches and seeing him fall to the floor, unable to move. Man. Man. What a life for a five-year-old child. Waking up in the middle of the night, having to use the restroom or the bathroom, some would call, we didn't have. We had an outhouse, meaning the bathroom was never connected to the house. The bathroom was across the field. So being five years old, I had to get up in the middle of the night by myself, walk through the snow to use the bathroom and come back in. When we finally got a house that had a bathroom, there was a hole in the ceiling. So when it would rain, when you used the bathroom, you got rained on. So, but it was a part of life that we had to live with. You know, it was, that's just where life was. Um, Kind of going off base of what this is, but anyway. Though these hardships as a kid, I looked at the hopes in my mother's eyes. And I knew that there would be a brighter day someday. Born to a mother who I found to be the greatest woman I'd ever known, 16 years old, my mom was 16 years old, three children, and earned $15 a week. She had to support three children off of $15 a week. My mom made sure that we were always dressed neatly every day and continued to instill great values in her children. Where she would often say, regardless of your circumstances, and most of you who know me, this is one of my sayings, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your circumstances, keep your head up and always remember there's a brighter day. She would repeat that daily. Well, one day that day came. Now having the time machine move forward when I became 18 years old, a young man instilled with the nurturing spirit and the wisdom of a God-sent mother, college life began for me. Having felt the pressures of gang life and the influence of friends during my college years, I found myself on a road to destruction. Dealing drugs seemed to be the quick way to make an easy dollar. Meaning, I could now find a way to what I thought I could make the wrong right. Running with my drug friends, three in the back seat, three in the front seat, we had decided to rob one of our drug competitions. Um, Arriving at the place of confrontation, we were subdued by the same people that we were going to subdue. A gun was put to my head, and I was told, if I didn't leave now, I would die. This is when I realized that my life, this is when I realized that my life had more in store that was very positive. I looked to God and asked God, if you get me out of this situation, 
I'll never look back at this again. No one was hurt that night. My eyes and my thoughts went back to what my mom always said to me. Regardless of your circumstances, there's a better day. Five years later, I was married with a son and a daughter. My first son, Andrew Lewis Montgomery III, life seemed pretty good for me. Things looked like they were going up for the up. But on October 29th, 1993, my three-year-old son died. He died of uh, encephalitis, which is a deterioration of the brain. I felt my life was, was over. I felt there was no, no, no use of even wanting to live again. But one day I began to look at my own circumstances and began to hear people that were, were talking to me during the time my son had died and said to me, you were an inspiration to me. When your son died, you were very cheerful to everyone. You continued to tell other people, don't worry about me. You look out for your own life. Each time you, you guys come to the car, I'm always trying to cheer you up. I'm always trying to share a better day with you. Because I, what you all know. And the reason why I do that, because I have lived a rough life. But I know there's a better day. This is one thing that I always say, and I'm going to close it out, and it's this. When you went to sleep last night, Somewhere in the world, somebody went to bed at the exact same time you did. But God loved you so much that he woke you up. Now, how is your day now? It's a better day. Our uh, final storyteller is Harris Ansari. Gosh, I hope he's here. I'm right here. Oh, hey. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so, so no, you can say that because i got to introduce you. Um, he's a double major in uh, poli-sci and economics, and if that wasn't enough, he decided to do CLP, too, because he's, like, masochistic or something. I don't know. Um, he's born in Chicago but has lived in federal Washington uh, for most of his life. Uh, as his story will reveal, he loves photography, loves traveling and writing, um, this is my favorite. Uh, his real favorite food is halim. Uh, but he told me that I could say it was vindala because more people would know what that is. <laughs> Who knows what either one of those is? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I'm like a food nerd and I, I don't even know what that is. Um, so in addition to eating copious amounts of vindalo, he aspires to be a civil rights attorney. Um, and you'll, you'll see why. So. up guys <laughs> all right so I'm just gonna dive right in um, so I remember the scene every time I think of this story um, I'm sitting on my bed in the Marriott in Islamabad uh, it's my junior year winter break and um, we're sitting in this room I'm sitting next to my dad um, my sister's crying and my mother's comforting her and no one's talked in this room for a solid hour not at all not a single word. And my dad turns to me and he grabs me and he goes, now you know why I left this country 20 years ago. So two hours before this, two, three hours before this, um, I'd been on a plane, I'd just woken up. Um, I was thinking about how excited I was to come to Pakistan. I hadn't been there in five years. Uh, it's where my parents were from. We were gonna do some work at my mom's orphanage that she just um, tried to sponsor. And uh, we were gonna see family, uh, eat food like Halim and Vindaloo. Um, so I was extremely excited, but all of a sudden I'd been awoken and um, the, the pilot came on and he said, uh, it, I mean, in the craziest tone, I just remember, I, I couldn't even understand what emotion was going through his head, but he just said that um, Benazir Bhutto had been assassinated in Rawalpindi, which is the city right next to Islamabad where we were going to land, and that's actually where the airport was. So he said, you know, when you land, make sure you figure out where you're going to go because there's going to be chaos. 
he didn't actually say that, but he said, you know, it's going to be bad. So, <laughs> so we land, and um, at, my sister has immediately started crying. Like, that's when it started. She cried for like three straight hours. And um, my mom's comforting her, and my dad's figuring out what we're going to do. So we get off this plane, and everyone runs to this little Marriott help desk, and we call, and we ask um, for a shuttle to come. And in that time, we uh, meet this other couple, and uh, two shuttles arrive. And um, we're going towards the highway, and we're like, it's okay, we're going to get through this, we're going to get home, it's not that big of a deal. My sister's screaming. And um, as we're coming towards the on-ramp, I just see this huge mob of people. We're like 200 people, and they're shaking cars, and they're lighting them on fire, and they're ripping tires off, lighting them on fire and throwing them in the air. And um, I mean, clearly we couldn't go that way. The highway was out of the question. <laughs> so, so our driver, um, he takes a little shortcut and takes us back, and he goes, we're going to go through the, the inner streets. We're going to go through the ghettos. And, you know, I had no idea what to expect at that point. Like, really? What's good? What does that mean? I've never seen that before. So we started to go through these streets, and it's the two shuttles still. Um, and I remember seeing poverty like I'd never seen before. At, at the beginning, it was, it was fear, you know, fear of what's going to happen. But all of a sudden, I mean, I just completely shifted towards sorrow and empathy. Because you're going through these mud roads with, um, you know, metal and mud brick homes and people are standing on top of their roofs throwing rocks just because, I mean, this is a time that they can express themselves. This is a time where they can release all of that emotional buildup from living on these streets covered in garbage with, on the street corners as we're driving, um, there's beggars. And these beggars have just been maimed, like limbs cut off, hands cut off, disfigured. Um, and they had to see that every day. They had to live with that. And so, we, so we're going through those streets and we're seeing all of this. And I remember we looked forward and the other, the couple was in the shuttle in front of us. And another mob had come down from a side street and started to shake their shuttle right in front of us. Um, and that was one of those moments where that, that fear came back in and I just, I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, that was my home. Like, what, how could this happen so close to home? Like, the people right in front of us. Um, so we took a side street and we cut out. We went deeper and deeper into the, this impoverished area, um, deeper into that labyrinth. And the driver realized that he didn't know where to go anymore. He was lost too. So my dad, who hasn't been back to Pakistan in, in, in 20 years, he tells him how to get through these old streets that he lived in just years ago. And he directed us all the way to that Marriott until that point where we were sitting on the bed. And that moment, that moment reminded me that I've always said I love my country, you know? I'm not an American, I'm Pakistani American. Always said that. And at that moment I realized that I had to do something to prove that, to prove that to people and to share this story and to share what I wanted to do for my country. And that's why this moment was so significant to me. Thank you, that was incredible. Um, all of the stories have been incredible. I wanna uh, turn it over to the panelists again and also to uh, questions in the audience. Yeah, and Gail and Kate, on that. we can walk around with too, but panelists, if you guys want to start us off before we open it up. Okay, cool. Okay. I would just like yeah. to say the beautiful arc in those stories we heard. I to thank all of you, but um, Harris, that last story, I mean, it had such an arc. And um, Andre and Katie's, yours, almost your introductions were almost the beginning of your story. And they came around. Um, oh. And that um, you all had three different structures. I felt like, uh, like Harris, you really you brought us right into the scene and and the emotional. Um, I mean, I was getting chills because you described it so vividly. And then you took us into the arc from being afraid, and I was afraid for you, to this compassion that you had, and it was it was quite profound because you brought us through though those stages of emotion. And Katie, um, 
to start with your daughters and then end with your daughters was such a powerful way of bringing us into the story. I drive down that same street, and so you had me, and we've all driven streets where we see that. Um, and Andre, that theme of your sayings, I guess I thought it was mozzarella, Pirelli or whatever, um, but, <laughs> but the, the strength of your mother's sayings, and we do have those, we all have those voices, and um, I, the repetition of your mother's voice was, was so strong. Thank you. Thank you to all the storytellers. It is so brave to do that. Does anyone have any questions or comments or want to react? Not all at once now. I, I just have a favor to ask. Um, Andre and Harris in particular, would each of you take just a moment to tell us just a little bit more about your lives now, where you are now in your lives? Um, I graduated from um, college school in 1984. I uh, was married for 20 some odd years. I had, um, I have a 24 year old daughter. I have a 15 year old daughter. This is my biological children. Um, and I have two 12 year old children. But I'm blessed because God has lived what I consider the best thing that I've ever had in my life. Um, when I thought that things were really coming to a head for me so far as my direction, um, I found this lady here. And I thank God for it. Uh, I don't want for much. I don't want for much. And people say, well, you know, are you, I, I, I'm just happy being who I am. I think that a lot of times that in life that we are concerned, are so consumed by what we can gain in life that we forget about the service of other people. And I, I, the reason why I, you see me smile every day and so cheerful every day because I feel like I need to be in the service of other people. I want to enlighten other people's lives. When he came and talked to me yesterday, that's one of the things that I stressed is that I want to be an inspiration to everyone that I touch, everyone that I touch for whatever level that might be. I want to touch someone's life so that they can, in, in turn, maybe be an inspiration to someone else's life. Uh, one thing, I, like I said before, it's just one of my passions, being in the service of someone. I would, I would rather forsake myself and give my life for someone else than worry about my own life. It's more important to, lo to love, you know me, you know me. I, I love everybody. I think, I think you know, me working at the car sometimes, I, I probably hug so many people like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> <laughs> everybody that I meet, you, I, as you yesterday, I, a hug is, can go a long way. You just never know what someone's day might be like. So in turn, turn your life around and be in service of other people. Don't be so concerned about your own life, but be concerned about someone else's life. Well, I like the story that you told. When you spoke about going through the red, going through the lights, and then all of a sudden you decided that, that didn't that didn't matter anymore, that you wanted to be in service of someone else, that means a lot. It goes a long way. Sometimes I think the world has been so consumed in, you know, how much we can get politics-wise, or how much we can get money-wise, or how much in education we can get, but we forget the service of other people. It's very important. Um, <laughs> I really know where to start, um, <laughs> especially after that, wow. <laughs> um, like we've said, uh, I'm a GU student. Um, I want to be a lawyer really badly, and after I uh, potentially go through that avenue, I want to um, maybe start a political career. I'm really politically interested. Um, in terms of, like, the, the story I told um, is interesting because I came back from it really, really motivated to do stuff, and like I told everyone I could like how powerful this moment was and shared all of the great pictures I took. And then after that, I, whenever I reflected on it, I kind of like repressed what I learned after that, like after the excitement phase. And um, recently, I've, I've realized how much that calling played a role in my life during that time, and I've kind of reinvigorated it. So um, my goal has been to to start a club that will 
begin Pakistani relief um, here at Gonzaga. Um, and I've tried to email a couple people and get it going. Um, I've got some TCF, uh, which is like a huge uh, Pakistani organization. I've got some connections there. And I want to involve that um, in terms of like where my, my story is going now. Um, but it hasn't really been as active as I wanted it to be, to be honest, until now. So I'm trying to re, I'm trying to use the fire that I know is still there because for like my entire senior year, I never reflected on that story again. Like I just kind of put it back. And then this year, I really like, I talked to my mom about it when she went back and when she went back to the orphanage and showed me all the pictures. And, and from then on, I've thought about this story every single day. So I, that's kind of where my progression has gone. Like, uh, it left my life and then it's come back and now I really want to make it um, a, a point that I'm going to move on from. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Harris. We only have a few minutes left and I, I want to just hear briefly, uh, the storytellers, um, we've heard from, from Andre and Harris, what was the effect of telling your story here? And I'm going to put Bailey on the spot. Uh, we're doing a really <laughs> cool project. Mary Beth and Eric, who's also here actually, from Lewis and Clark High School were gracious enough to invite us in. And uh, Caitlin and Ashley and Kristen and Hannah have gone over with, with a bunch of students actually and, and uh, done a sharing of stories. So it's really been cool to, to be a part of this and just to watch it occur and stuff. But what was the effect of telling the story? Bailey, how would you answer that? What, like, what was it like to be up here and other than being scared to death and stuff? And um, Ms. Smith wouldn't let me go to the bathroom before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that was really bothering me. Um, but it was, it was nice. I mean, I, like, I don't share my writing ever, ever. Like, I... I Miss Smith today, like last year, I had a creative writing class and didn't turn anything in. And I was lucky the teacher liked me and I got a C. But I didn't turn anything in because I didn't like my writing. And um, it's just, it, I mean, I guess it always feels like, feels good to write down. I, I don't know. It feels good to write down. I really want to write. I really want to go, I, I really want to grow up and write and and travel and go to college. I'm so excited about college and and hopefully have it stories like these guys. It just feels good. It feels good to Katie, how was it for you? Thanks. Um, well, it was a little bit risky just because I know a lot of people here. And, uh, you know, a little bit nervous about telling that story. Um, even though, at the same time, though, it's not extraordinary. I mean, I literally, everybody has an amazing story somewhere tucked in there. There's nothing extraordinary about this. And, um, and that's the part that's so interesting, that literally everyone in this room probably could sit up there and tell some just tear-jerking or just hilarious story. And, and so that's the part that's so cool, is just this, the chance to get the to share it, and again, um, let me just go back to all the folks who, whose stories are unfinished, especially with the homeless, um, just that sometimes they don't get to write their own story at times. It feels like their lives are, they no longer are the authors um, until they get control again and can finish their story or continue writing it. So anyway. Eric, Rudy, Rita, any, what was it like to share your story? And well, I, th I think it wasn't, I had time before. Um, I think it was that it, it wasn't the presentation as much as I spent all day thinking about that printer. So I thought about today, while I was lecturing, while I was writing, whatever. And, and I just, it, I'm coming to a different way of thinking about it now. That's what happened. It was just the preparation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question I always ask my students because they're all looking at me, so I better ask them. <laughs> what did you want us to know about you through the sharing of that? See, <laughs> you know this question. I, I huh. if I wanted to really share something personal there, I think what what I've learned about that printer was about when other people do things for me. That there's this enormous immaturity in me, <coughs> that ego and pretense keep me from just accepting what he did 
from other people in my life that love me. My wife, for unknown reasons, loves me. <laughs> and I just, need to, I just need to accept that. It's not something I earn. I didn't earn that gift from that printer. I didn't do anything. I didn't earn anything from my wife loving me. I just, I just immature in that way. I just can't accept it. Thank you. I just like talking. <laughs> no, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm just kidding. I think that one of the things I've only been here for six months, and one of the things that I told myself just the other day, I had realized like one of the things that I've been pushing a lot here is to help students and empower students to know that they have a voice. Uh, and oftentimes, students can go like I did when I was an undergrad through the margins and not share their story and be oppressed and have these injustices in higher education because they belong to a certain community or certain group or because they're first generation. And so events like this, you know, hearing her story, you know, as early as, what grade are you, junior? That's what's up, you know? <laughs> That's p empowering. And one of the things that I want to do here as a GU staff is to help students find their voice and tell their stories so that positive, transformative change can happen here while you're a student at GU. So if I could put myself out there and tell my story, make a fool of myself, so that y'all can find your voice, and I'll keep doing that. And plus, I like it. Um, I think for me, it's a good reflection, because sometimes I tend to just keep going and going and going, and I forget, or I try to forget about stuff and pretend it's not there. And I know a lot of people in this room right now, and I can guarantee that nobody knows my story. I mean, I barely talk about it with my friends just because it's something that I feel like I don't, I don't need to think about. So I think it's good reflection for myself, as well as like just opening the eyes of GU students and realizing that you, you don't really know the people that you think you know. And just you know, be aware of that and be aware of the way you act and the way you treat people because you don't know what happened to them that day or the day before. So. I need to close with something clever, I guess. I, I um, I'm looking up at one of my colleagues, Dr. Adi Simha is here, and he teaches diversity, and he brought our, his class with him from our graduate program in, in uh, organizational leadership. And he, he wrote to me, he said, Joe, would it be appropriate for me to bring my students? And I said, yeah, I think so. I mean, I've got to think about this a little bit, you know, but I think so. And, and the idea, as it surfaced in our class uh, with my students, was we wanted to hear stories that, again, that you don't normally hear. And I'm looking at international studies folks are here and uh, international students. And, and uh, I want to hear those stories. I want to hear the stories that we don't normally get to tell. Uh, people that we see every day, but we don't know their stories. And, and what I was thinking was, when I was walking in Sodexo yesterday to meet Andre, Caitlin and I were going over there. And, um, and I remember uh, Patrick uh, Rios, who's, who's in my class, he interviewed Andre for an assignment. And he was telling Andre's story in my class, and everybody was like, that Andre? It was just like that, you know, and it's like, oh, you know, and, and suddenly he's a different person now because you know his story. And so often I think we get very comfortable marginalizing people or demonizing people we don't know or understand. And I, I think when we know their story, we can't do that anymore. It changes. It, ch it changes the relationship. And there's a wonderful program coming out of Rochester, New York called Mosaic Partnerships, which I often push um, as a great model. And, and it's very simply... Uh, people get together and agree to get pair up for a period of, I, I think it's a year, and it's usually um, uh, cross-race partnering. And all they do is get together once a month to tell each other their stories. Mm -hmm. Very powerful, and, and uh, it's a real healing process that people go through. And that was one of our goals tonight, it was to begin to hear each other's stories. So uh, it's not so easy to dismiss people or ignore people anymore or be afraid of them. <laughs> like, like Katie's great story about homeless people. And I'm the same way, you know. So, oh, God, I'll fumble for my change and pray for a green light, you know, because uh, I'm uncomfortable and I don't know these people. Um, but her story brings them to life and, and gives them a name and a background and a history and a story, so it's powerful. I want to thank uh, the panelists. Thank you guys very much. I just threw you guys into this, and I really appreciate um, Kirk and Nicole and, and Claire for being here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> Especially I want to thank our, our storytellers. Uh, Bailey, you did great tonight. Thank you so much for joining and be a part of our community.
and the rest of you, is, uh, it's courageous. Thank you for doing this. We're hoping to continue this in the spring. And we'd love feedback, encouragement, interest in collaboration, anything to keep this going. I want to thank Caitlin, though. Uh, she'll finish here in December, actually. Mm. So, uh-oh. So we'll need help to keep these things going. So if you have any interest, please let us know. But I want to thank all of you for coming. Zag Shop, thank you again for co-sponsoring this. And there's a reception outside right afterwards. And we got to get out of here because there's a class coming in. Thank you all for being here.